ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ಭಾಗವತಾಂಶಿಲಾಖ್ಯಚುರಾಮಿಲಿತಂಯೇನಸ್ಮೈಶ್ರೀಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತಾಂಸಾವೂತಂಪರಿಜನಸೈತಾಂಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾಂಸಹಗಣಾಲಿತಾಶ್ರ
Hare Krishna. <coughs> so we'll go to verse number 52, Shri Prabhupada's explanation. Now we find that there's a difference of opinion between Draupadi and Bhima especially. <coughs> and even Krishna and Adi have said that don't spare him. So it means Krishna and Bhima is telling Arjuna kill him. Whereas Draupadi, Yudhishthira and others were saying no, don't kill him. So there's a conflict, I mean, a kind of a controversy to kill or not to kill. Now, in this case, while this kind of opposite views were going on, Krishna manifested four arms. That's why in this was, it's called Chatur Bhucha. Chatur means four. And these four arms, Krishna can display because actually he's originally, I mean, Krishna, from Krishna comes Vishnu. So he can display four arms whenever he wants to. And he can even display hundreds of arms, like when he did in the Bhagavad Gita, if you read the 11th chapter, it's called Vishnu Rupa, the universal form. Krishna displayed many, many arms, many, many heads, many, many legs, endless, which even Arjun could not see, all of them. So, <clears throat> Krishna manifested four arms, four. He wanted Ashwatthama to be killed and later said he should be forgiven. Krishna resides with, the, with his devotees in Vrindavan. Now you find that when you go to Vaikuntha, as per the description given in the Srimad Bhagavatam and Brahma Sabita, Vaikuntha is not just one place. It is a big variety. Now even if you see the cover of our first candle of Srimad Bhagavatam, you get some idea if you see the cover of this. This is all Vaikuntha. And this Vaikuntha starts after passing Brahma Jyoti and Kailash. Kailash means place where Lord Shiva and Parvati is residing. And then you go upwards. This is also called Haridam. Vaikuntha is also called Haridam. Then above this is this plant, which is shown in the front, which is Krishna Loka or Vrindavan. So in all this form of other places, the Lord is Chatur Bhujya, four-handed arm, four-handed personalities. And you can read on the cover of this book, different, different names, Sridhar, Aniruddha, Praniruddha, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Pradyumna, Narayan, Keshav, and so on. But here, Krishna resides, Krishna is two-handed forms. In all the three divisions of Krishna Loka. Even in Krishna Loka, there are three divisions. There's Dwarka, there's Vrindavan or Krishna, Krishna Loka itself. And the third one is called Gokul. Now you find that even in three, there are different forms of Krishna. Where there is the Ashoda and the Manmaras, Krishna is very young, very small. So if one loves baby Krishna or his small Krishna, then he goes to Gokul. If he loves opulent Krishna, Dwarkadish and Rukmini, then he goes to Dwarka. And if he likes Krishna as he is loving Krishna with his feet, then he goes to Vrindavan. So here Sri Prabhupada explains that <clears throat> in the Krishna Loka, this too, he enjoys his pastimes with two-handed form. Whereas in all other planets, in Vaikuntha is four-handed form. And the, the form he showed to Arjuna was having hundreds and hundreds of arms and so many uh, uh, features you can read when you read Bhagavad Gita. So anyway, we go a little further. It says, in the, we find our Acharyas explaining that in a, in a relaxed mood, Krishna is too, uh, too armed and he plays a flute. We can hear this uh, prayers in the Brahma Samhita, what he looks like. And Prabhupada puts this description in many, many purports. Even in Bhagavad Gita, at least three times he has put this. If you go to the purport of Man Manabhava Mad Bhakto Mad Yajimam Namashkuru, uh, then if you read the second paragraph, uh, I would request if someone can read the second paragraph of 1865, if someone has Bhagavad Gita in hand.
1865. If no one, then I can read. There's no one to read. I can read. Second paragraph in the Manmana Bhav Mat Bhakti Bhav Gita, it says, these words stress that one should concentrate his mind upon Krishna, the very form with two hands carrying a flute, the bluish boy with a beautiful face and peacock feathers in his hair. There are descriptions of Krishna found in Brahma Samhita and other literatures. One should fix his mind on this original form of Godhead. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. The Lord has multi forms as Vishnu, Narayan, Rama, Vara, etc. But a devotee should concentrate his mind on the form that was present before Archan. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge. And this is disclosed to Arjun because Arjun is the most dear friend of Krishna's. So we find that in this purple, Sri Prabhupada gives a complete description of what Krishna looks like. So Krishna is two-handed. Original Supreme Lord is two-handed. And to do his work in this material world, he has used two four-handed form. Just like in this particular scene, we should understand the scene. What is actually happening? Ashwatthama had released Brahmastra. And when, when he was being chased, because before that he had done a heinous crime, he had killed the son of the Pandavas. He had killed one Akshoni Sena, which means one whole flanks of army was killed when they were sleeping. And it is aggression, it's a sin to kill someone in sleep. And he also killed the brother of Draupadi. And then he disappeared. He ran away and he was chased by Krishna and Arjun. Now, when he found Krishna and Arjun come very close, he released Brahmastra. Brahmastra is very, very powerful. It's a nuclear weapon and it contains a lot of fire inside that it can even destroy the world. Now, he's such a foolish person. He knew how to release, but he did not know how to withdraw it. So Krishna tells Arjuna that you also send a Brahmastra so that you can counteract and then try to bring both of them together down. Otherwise, millions of people will die. So hearing the attention of, I mean, the words of Krishna, instructions of Krishna, Arjuna did the same and he captured Ashwatthama, he brought him back. So this is the scene. When he was brought back, he was tied like an animal with ropes. And Draupadi, as we read earlier, was not happy. He says, being the son of our guru, Dronacharya, from whom we earned or learned so many arms and mantras, don't tie him like an animal, release him. So he was released. But then Bhima was adamant. He says, to release is okay but you kill him. And nobody said, don't kill him. So this was the kind of a difference of opinions. One wanted him to be killed and another one. Now, when you say Bhima wanted to kill, Krishna also agreed, yes, he must be killed, he's an aggressor. And when you say Draupadi, she said, don't kill him. He's the son of a Brahmin and he's a Brahmin. And not only that, he's a son of your spiritual master from whom you earn or learn warfare. So spare him. And even Yudhishthir agreed not, not to have him killed, including Sadev, Nakul. All of them refused. So you can imagine what is happening in the scene. And that's why we find that Krishna, for Arjun, took up this matter very seriously. And smiling, he gives a solution, which is there in text 53 and 54. So I'll read the Sanskrit. 53 and 54, Shri Bhagavan Avacha, Brahma Bandhu Na Hantavya, Atatai Varda Hana, Mayayo Bhayam Amnatam, Paripahi Anushashanam, Kuru Prati Shrutam Shatyam Yat Tat Shantavayata Priyam, Priyam Cha Bhishma Sa Nesha Panchalya Mahayam Evacha. Translation The personality of God is Sri Krishna said, A friend of a Brahmin is not to be killed. But if he is an aggressor, he must be killed. 
All these rulings are in the scriptures and you should act accordingly. You have to fulfill your promise to your wife and you must also act to the satisfaction of Bimasen and me to try to understand the verse. The instructions are very clear in the first two lines of the Sanskrit. It says, Brahmar bandhu na hantavyo. If he's a Brahmin, don't kill him. Atatai vada hartavyo. If he's atatai, he's an aggressor, he should be killed. So it's a kind of a very confusing statement Krishna has made. One way he says kill him, another way he says not kill him. So that everybody can become pleased. Mother, you can read the purport. Bhagavad by Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Arjuna was perplexed because Ashwatthama was to be killed as well as spared according to the different scriptures cited by different persons. As a Brahmabandhu or a worthless son of a Brahmana, Ashwatthama was not to be killed, but he was at the same time an aggressor also. And according to the ruling of Manu, an aggressor, even though he be a Brahmin, and what to speak of an unworthy son of a Brahmana, is to be killed. Dronacharya was certainly a Brahmana in the true sense of the term, but because he stood in the battlefield, he was killed. But although Ashwatthama was an aggressor, he stood without any fighting weapons. The ruling is that an aggressor, when he is without weapon or chariot, cannot be killed. All these were certainly per Complexities. Besides that, Arjuna had to keep the promise he had made before Draupadi just to pacify her. And he also had to satisfy both Bhima and Krishna who advised killing him. This dilemma was present before Arjuna and the solution was awarded by Krishna. Hare Krishna. So in this two verses, some points are there. Arjuna is definitely in dilemma whether to kill or not to kill Brahmin called Ashwatthama. According to the Shastri etiquette, you cannot kill someone who has no weapons. If someone has no weapons to protect him, you can't kill him. That is one question. He was told to kill by Biva. That means he had to kill. Nobody said not to kill. Yiddish said don't kill. So it's like a very, very confusing statement and a very confusing situation. So he killed, why Ashwatthama should be killed? One reason was he killed in cold blood the children of the Pandavas. They were sleeping at night. And others, they, they even didn't have weapons. So Arjun should kill him because he had done a crime, a heinous crime. In the Bhagavad Gita, if you read uh, chapter one, Text 36, six kind of aggressions are mentioned. One of the, the first one, let me go, I see the Bhagavad Gita and give you the exact, all the six aggressions you can, those who have Bhagavad Gita, they can listen to Bhagavad Gita. Six kind of aggressions should not be spared. In the Vedic times, the law was very, very strong. So who are they? Just a minute. Number one is a poison giver. If someone kills someone by administrating poison, he should be killed. If one sets fire to the house, he should be killed. If one attacks with deadly weapons, he should be killed. If one plunders the riches, he should be killed. Number five, one who forcefully occupies another land, he should be killed. Six, one who kidnaps a wife. So all six kinds of aggressions, according to the Vedic law, they should not be spared, they should be killed. In today's world, if you have money, then you may not be killed because you may get a very good lawyer and you may bribe the, what do you call, the judge and you, there'll be no punishment. But in the Vedic times, it was not like that. There was no corruption and there was very fair trial. These days, the court can go on for months and months. In the older times, 
if a serious case was there, it was brought in front of the king. And the king would give the verdict the very same day. Unless they needed extra witnesses. It was done a very fair way. That's why in a monarchy, people would be thinking twice before they break any law. But in the democracy, in the capitalism or communism, people don't care. They say, oh, I have a good lawyer. I have money. I know what to do. In this way, the law has become weak. That's why the crime has gone up. Anyway, he has shown that as a Brahmin, he should not be killed. But as an aggressor, he must be killed. This is the argument, which is in the shloka itself. Though he is a Brahmin, so he should not be killed. But if he is a Brahmin and if he is an aggressor, he should be killed. This is the Krishna's instruction. Don't spare him if he is an aggressor. And definitely he was an aggressor. So on the, on the other hand, we find that Arjuna had already promised Draupadi, which led this to a dilemma, making him perplexed. And Krishna has already given him Krishna gave the solution. What to do? Kill him and not kill him. <laughs> if we were in Arjuna's place, definitely we would be confused also. In one way, we are told, kill him to please Bhima. Another way, he was told, not kill him. Then, what to do? To, I mean, why? To please Draupadi. And he has to please both of them. One is his brother, one is his wife. So in a family, whenever any, if, if there is any misunderstanding, this is the way the dealing has to be done. We can learn from this verse. That's why we find that in all big families, there is generally a bit of trifle, and it should be settled by using scriptures or people who know scriptures. In the Vedic times, if there was any conflict, they would call Brahmins and they would sort it out. Not even that, even 500 years ago in Vrindavan, if people had problems in Vrindavan, They'll call Sanatana Goswami and the problem will be dealt. And he would give the solution. Like we hear you know, the story of Sakshi Gopal in Chitan Chathamat, when there's a confusion between the uh, younger Brahmin and the elder Brahmin. The younger Brahmin said that this elder Brahmin had promised that he'll give his daughter to me. And now he's keeping quiet. So Panchayat, Panchayat means five elders were brought. And they ask how much truth is there. And then they say, if when the promise was made, was there any witness? They said, yes, it was Gopal, Krishna. He says, then we have to go there or he can come here. Of course, everybody knows that Gopal is a deity, Murti, in a temple. So the elder son said that if that Gopal can come here, and become the witness, I'll give my sister. Very, very tricky situation. But the younger Brahmin had a full faith. So what did he do? He said, I'll bring Krishna here. He went walking, imagine. Vidyanagar is near Madras, South India, Chennai now. He went walking right up to Vrindavan. He came in front of the Lord and told the Lord, Oh, my Lord, do you remember this incident when I came here some months ago. The elder Brahmin had offered his daughter Jamuna to me. And the deity spoke, yes, it is true. Then the younger Brahmin tells Krishna, then you have to come with me. And the deity replied, I can't walk because I am a statue. How can I walk? I'm still. Then the Brahmin is very intelligent. He says, if you can walk, if you can talk, it means you can walk. In this way, Krishna was completely trapped by the Brahmin. And Krishna agreed on a condition. I shall walk behind you. And you can hear me walking because my mother Yashoda has tied ankle bells on my feet. But you shall not look at me. And daily you will feed me rice, sweet rice. Will you do that? He said, yes. I'll happily do that. In this way, it took weeks and weeks before they could read what he called uh, Vidyanara. And before even the town came, the outskirts of the town, <clears throat> the Brahmin <clears throat> had a thought. 
He says, all these days he's walking behind me and I have never seen him. The big, big yogis, after thousands of years, may see Krishna, not even Krishna, they see Vishnu. But I'm so fortunate that Krishna is behind me. And we all know that he thought that when I see him, I know he's going to become a statue. And even if he becomes a statue, it doesn't matter because everybody knows there's no statue of Krishna here because it's already on the border of the town, outskirts of the town. So in this way, he turned his face and looked at Krishna and he found to his shocks, Krishna was huge, beautiful, so beautiful that one can't even dream of it. But Krishna still spoke from the statue, go and bring your witnesses. I shall be the witness. So this is a beautiful part of Sakshi Gopal. So what Krishna does, he gives intelligence to his devotee. In the Bhagavad Gita, if you go to <coughs> chapter 10, verse number 10, Tesam satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam jenamam upiyatite For those who constantly discern me, I give them the intelligence by which they can come to me. So, our duty is to simply to engage in the Sankirtan. Tesam satata yuktanam. It means Sankirtan, hearing about Krishna, remembering Krishna, serving Krishna, and so on. If you engage in those ninefold devotional practices, then you can actually purchase Krishna. Krishna is yours. But these services are meant to be done non-stop, 24 hours a day. Some of you may argue, can we do, how can we serve when you're sleeping? Yes, even before you go to sleep, think of Krishna and then go to sleep. In this way, we find that Krishna gives the solution to Arjuna. And what does Arjuna do? In the text 55, we'll go to the text 55, I think it has no purport. No, it has a purport. Sutta Vacha Arjuna Saha Jinaya Arir Hardam Atashina Manim Jahara Murdhamyam Dvijasya Sahabodhacham. Just then Arjun could understand the motive of the Lord by his equivocal orders and thus with his sword he severed both hair and jewel from the head of Ashwatthama. Mother, you can read the purport. Purport by Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Contradictory orders of different persons are impossible to carry out. Therefore, a compromise was selected by Arjun by his sharp intelligence, and he separated the jewel from the head of Ashwatthama. This was as good as cutting off his head, and yet his life was saved for all practical purposes. Here, Ashwatthama is indicated as twice born. Certainly he was twice born, but he fell down from his position and therefore he was properly punished. Hare Krishna. So here in the 55, Ajit using his fine intelligence acted wisely, which pleased everyone. How? He removed the jewel on Ashwatthama. There was a jewel right in the middle here. It was a sign of Brahminical culture, and it was removed. His head was shaved. So he said, he's as good as a dead man, like a Kshatriya. If a Kshatriya is insulted, he's as good as a dead Kshatriya. But if a Brahmin, his hair is removed and jewel is removed, he's dead. Though living, but dead. And at the same time, <clears throat> his life was spared for other purposes. And you not believe later on, Krishna even curses him when he used the Brahmastra again to kill Parikshit. Krishna cursed him that you'll never die. Even when you want to die, you can't die. You can't commit even a suicide. So it is believed that even till now, Ashwatthama is still there. Some people say they have seen him and that mark of cut here is still there on the forehead. How true it is, because I don't have any proof for it. as such, but this is what I have heard. But according to Bhagavatam, he is there. Amar. Amar means he can't die. Imagine you are dying and you don't you can't die. If you go to your 
to feel, visit sometimes your friends or maybe 90 over. And sometimes we fold it and he says, why don't you pray for me that I die when someone is suffering? But he can't die because still, who is the giver of life is Krishna. Who takes your life away is also Krishna. Everything is dependent on him. It's not your choice. Prabhupada mentions in many, many lectures that he gives a story of a dying man and he, a very, very rich man. So he's pleading to his doctor, extend my life just four hours. I have some work to do. And the doctor said, impossible, not possible. So we, any of Chanakya Pandit says that time gone is never going to be, cannot be replaced by paying millions of dollars. Even one minute cannot be purchased. What to talk of more, more than that. The minute which has passed, if you waste it, it's not going to come back. That's why in the Padma Puran, Lord Shiva tells Parvati that Svatatya Satatam Vishnu Visvatya Na Jatu Jeet. Always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. So this instruction is one instruction, rather two instructions, in which all the rules and regulations of the Vedic scriptures are fitted inside. All others are byproducts of this particular verse. This verse is very, very important, spoken by Lord Shiva himself. That always remember Lord Krishna, that means who is the origin of Vishnu. Always remember him and never forget him. The meaning is the same. It's like two sides of the same coin. So we can know that it's very, very, why was he cursed by Krishna? First of all, he is already attempted he already killed in cold blood, he ran away. He was caught. He was spared. And he does it again. He released the second Brahmastra later on to destroy the last sign which was in the womb of Uttara, the wife of Abhimanyu. He was the only person living. The whole Pandu family, the, what he called, the generations to come, they were all killed in this war, the Mahabharata war. Nobody was spared. Only the five pounds lived, but no children lived, no children's children lived. The only sign left was what he called. Later on, he became Parikshit and Krishna protection, which is a subject matter when we read the prayers of Kun Kunti, very, very coming very soon. So anyway, in this particular verse, we find that he killed him and yet he did kill him. He followed the instruction of Krishna. Everybody knows how he killed him. At the same time, he did not kill him. We find that even in our Vedic culture, if a Brahmin, his hair is cut, he's as good as dead. If a Kshatri is abused, he's as good as dead. If a Vaishya becomes a debtor, he's as good as dead. Vaishya is a businessman. If he's borrowed money and he, ref he refuses to pay the money, he, he is a businessman, but he's a dead businessman. Nobody will respect him. Nobody trusts him. Nobody will give him goods. Nobody will give him loan. This is in Vedic culture, such a high class culture, which is not existing anymore. But still, we find that even till now, there are people who are following the culture. Sri Prabhupada mentions in one lecture of a certain lawyer. Uh, he was in the time of Sri Prabhupada. He explains in one lecture that when he died, he had some debts. And his son paid all the debts. Imagine. His son paid all the debts. Even in Nairobi, in the old shops which are here on the Beashara Street, which was originally called the Bazaar, many of these are Jains. Even they have this policy that if the father dies, the son pays. And many, of, many other businesses, man. In the Indian community, this rule is still there. So Vedic culture is still followed. Now it's gradually or very fast getting destroyed. That is why this mission of Sri Prabhupada is to bring back the Vedic culture and bring, that, bring back that rich culture so that people can live very, very happily. So we'll move on to the next verse, 56. Vimucha Rashana Badam Bala Hatya Hatta Prabham 
तेज सीपरायत ही Ashutama had already lost his bodily lustre due to the infanticide, and now, moreover, having lost the jewel from his head, he lost even more strength. Thus, he was unbound and driven out of the camp. It's only one line per part. I'll read. Thus, being insulted and humiliated, Ashutama was simultaneously killed. And not killed by the intelligence of Lord Krishna and Arjuna. That means he had no more bodily lustre. Is you find that even us, if we sin, we lose our bodily lustre. Bodily lustre does not mean that from black you become white. No, that's not the meaning. Lustre can be seen in the face of anybody. It can be even a dark person or a white person or a brown person or a yellow person. The glow of the face. If you commit any heinous crime, you find your glow goes away. Just like when we are not happy, depressed, the face looks different. What do they say? The face is the index of the mind. So if we find that his face had lost the last lustre, talking about the lustre, Prabhupada had so much glow on his face, even in the elderly age. First time when he was visiting London, he was invited to one university. Uh, it was an English university, and Prabhupada was invited. And as he was walking, students could see him near the window coming in the hall, and everyone agreed that he has a very bright face. Though he's an el elderly person, seventy plus, but the face had so much brilliance. And in America, there's another incident that when he came from the plane out, and in America at that time, the Hare Krishna movement was like like fire. So at airport, there were hundreds of devotees chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So the cleaner at the airport was watching everything. And then Prabhupada came out from the plane. As he came into the airport, everybody bowed down simultaneously. And everybody spoke the Prabhupada mantra, Namo Vishnu Padai, we all know that. And the, all this was watched by the cleaner. And then the newspaper people were there and they asked him, what did you say? He says, I saw everything. But one thing was amazing. And he said it in the American term. He was shining. <laughs> he was shining. <laughs> that means there was a glow on Prabhupada because he was a pure person. So if you become pure, also you'll have glow. In Gujarati, we say tej. Even in Sanskrit, you say tej, like the sun. You find any holy person or in a painting of Krishna or demigods, you find light outside the face. It actually indicates the glow. Now, in the case of Ashutama, he lost the glow, glow due to committing a heinous crime. So that's why we should not commit crime, nor should we sin. Prabhupada has given us four regulatory principles. Don't break it. If you keep up those principles and keep up your devotional service, chanting your rounds for like four regulatory principles are called yam. And the niyam is the 16 rounds. You find if you do this to yam and niyam, then day by day, you will remain a very happy person. Nothing can give you happiness the way bhakti gives you happiness, Krishna consciousness. It brings you so much happiness that your face will have glow. Your face also will have a very special smile. That anyone whom you meet can at once know that he's a very happy person. Where does this happiness come from? It's by practicing Krishna consciousness. So if you are practicing Krishna consciousness, stay away from sinning. Stay away from committing offenses. All kinds of offenses. Offenses are at least four. Offenses to the devotees called Vaishnava Parata. Very serious. Offense committed while chanting the holy name, offense in a holy dham, and offense in your service to Krishna. These four offenses should be avoided. And try to remain humble and meek, you become a very happy person. Even while chanting, you'll find that if you practice humility, you'll enjoy your chanting. And I'm sure while chanting, you'll smile also. I can assure you that. Because as you practice and practice, 
the, your humility will increase and increase and increase. It, it means Krishna becomes bigger, 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 you become smaller, smaller, smaller. This is the, the whole formula behind becoming humble. Because as you realize the greatness of Krishna, you also realize your position that I'm nothing in front of Krishna. And day by day, you realize that you're littleness. And you become little and little and little. And Krishna becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But Krishna is so merciful that you may be even just very small. Krishna will still accept you. And he loves you. In the fifth verse of the Shastaka, it says, E nanda taru chakin karam patitana vishame bhava babuddho kripya tava pada panka chastita duli siddharsham vichintiya O Krishna, some other, I have fallen into this material world. Kindly pick me up and put me as a dust at your lotus feet, spoken by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the mood one has to develop, that I am very insignificant in the whole creation, and it's little. There's one incident I'd like to share with you. In the time of Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he was holding his Tamal Krishna Maharaj. He was a bit very aggressive, and Prabhupada noted that sometimes you become too aggressive and rough, then other, the devotees will go away from the temple. The temple will become empty. You can't be rough. So in order to teach him, uh, Prabhupada explained in a very special way. He says, how many planets are there? And he replied, I think nine. <laughs> Mercury, Venus, and so on. He says, among these planets, which is our planet? He said, Earth. On Earth, how many continents are there? He said, five. How many countries? He said, numberless. Which is the country where we are living? He said, America. Which town? San Francisco. Which street? This street. And who are we? This is just very little, it's a map of the entire creation. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj was very interesting. He could understand what Prabhupada was saying. So sometimes we become too proud that I'm very big. But compare yourself with the front of fire. Another incident given in Chaitanya the Chaturman. We all know this incident. I'll just repeat for the sake of repeating. Brahma was visiting Krishna in Dwarka. And the gatekeepers are asking, uh, Sir, where are you? And uh, where have you come from? Hey, don't you know I am Brahma? I am four-headed. He said, yes, but we have to tell Krishna. We have to tell Dwarkatish. So they went to tell Dwarkatish that Brahma has come. So Krishna knew that he's too proud. So Krishna said, ask him from which Brahma, which planetary system. So Brahma said, tell Krishna, Chaturmukha. Chaturmukha means four-handed. Again they came. He said, Chaturmukha, let him in. And before he came in, Krishna invited all the other Brahmas. So some Brahmas were eight-headed, some were 16, some were 24, some were 100, some were 1,000 and and our Brahma forehead it was like a rabbit in front of elephants. Compare the size of elephants and then a rabbit. And if a rabbit sees an elephant, it's very scared <laughs> because he can easily be trampled. So in this way, Krishna smashed the pride of Brahma. So in, in, in devotional service, Krishna removes our pride and we become prideless, which is actually very, very useful to us. If you become pride, prideless, you progress in devotional service. You can chant extra rounds, more rounds. You hear Krishna Kata, you love Krishna Kata. But if the pride is there, the sweetness is not there. You can make kheer, kheer with sweet rice. Instead of putting sugar, <clears throat> mistakenly you put sand inside. What will be the taste? And who is going to eat it? So pride is like sand in sweet rice. Nobody likes it. So we have to be very careful in devotional service. Even this verse is explained in the 15th uh, chapter. I think it's verse number five of Bhagavad Gita. Nirmana Moha Jita Shanga Dosha Adhyatma Nitya Venivartakam. If you go to the purport, Sri Prabhupada said, This is the surrounding process. The verse itself is the surrounding process. And then the whole of the purport explains only one thing how to remove pride. We come to this world for a few years and we become so puffed up 
that I am the owner of this, I am this, I am this, we are this. I and mine is increasing. But when the I and my decreases and completely removed, then Krishna is yours. Very nicely explained. So if you want to learn surrendering, then two verses in Bhagavad Gita. One is Nirman Moha and the other one is Sarva Dharma Paritanshya. Both the purpose explain you how to become prideless. So we move on to the 57. 57 and 58, both don't have purpose. 57, Vabanam Dravina Adanam Stanam Niryapanam Tata Eshahi Brahma Bandunam Madona Nyoshi Dai Kaha. Translation <clears throat> Cutting the hair from his head, depriving him of his wealth, and driving him from his residence are the prescribed punishments for the relative of a Brahmin, not the word relative. Brahmin Bandhu, not Brahmin. That means it's not fit to be a Brahmin. There is no injunction for killing the body. Still, the Brahmin cannot be killed. Text 58 is the final verse. Pushputra Shoka Tura Sarve Madhava Saha Krishnaya Swanam Mithanam Yat Krithyam Chakshur Nirahana Dikam. Thereafter, the sons of Pandu and Draupadi, all went with grief perform the proper rituals for the dead bodies of their relatives. So you find that is called antreshtya, kriya. Antreshtya means last ritual of life. You find that in our Vedic culture, there are at least 10 rituals which are performed or which have to be performed once we come to this planet. If you want, I can uh, speak them. The first one is called before birth, Garbhada and Samska, before conception. Then three months pregnancy is called Pumshavan. For the production of child in the womb is called Simantam. For, in, for intellectual development of the child, Jatakarma. Name giving ceremony after birth is called Namakarana. First outing of the child is called Nishkramanam. First grain fed to the child is called Anaprasanam. Hair cutting is called Chuda Karvanam, uh, Karanam. Piercing the ears, Karna Vedam. Child taught to write is called Vidya Arabam. Offering Janoi, if he's a Brahmin, Kshatri, or Vaishya, that is called Upanayam. Before and after each year of study is called Praishartham. First shaving of a boy is called Keshantham. And for a girl, it is called Riti Shuddhi. Sambartam, end of education, Vivaha, marriage, and Antyeshti is the final ritual which takes place at the time of death. So, in, in the Vedic culture, 10 samskaras have to be followed. So, when samskara is followed, then how generally it is done is explained in the next chapter. How to go, how the body should be cremated how everyone should go to the river or go and take a bath, and what is, has to be done <clears throat> will be explained in the next chapter to come. Already, I've gone a little beyond the time. Hare Krishna, please forgive me for that. Any questions? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, no Prabhuji, you are in time, on time. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, I have a question before anybody asks a question. Mm -hmm. Ruti, you mentioned, and it, we have uh, gone through this before as well, that you should just concentrate on the form of Krishna, the two-handed form with the flute. Um, but Prabhuji, in our temple, we have um, uh, Vishnu and um, uh, Lakshmi, and we have the Laddu Gopal and uh, Dwarkadesh. And even when we come to the temple, we have uh, Ram, Sita, Lakshman, and other deities. So, Prabhuji. Yes, yes, Prabhuji. So, yeah. even so when you say you just concentrate on one, what does it mean? What do we do with the others? Even in our, okay, our we, oh, temple. Okay. The, uh, I understand your question. The understanding of concentrating on Krishna form is that all these other forms are none different from Krishna. But the origin is. Krishna. This is Prabhupada's understanding. Shamsudra is the origin. 
from him comes everything. So if you read Brahma Savita, it says Ramadi Bhutishu Kaladniya Mena Tishta. This verse says that Rama, Nashinga, Vama, Nwara, all of them come from Krishna. So for example, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Puri first time. We all know the form of Jagannath, it's very different. Jagannath Baldev. But he did not see Jagannath, he saw Shamsuna. That's why he fainted. I mean, he became unconscious in ecstasy. So we have to be in the, be in the same boat. Even when we are seeing Rama, we should know he's Krishna also. Even when you're seeing Lakshmi Narayan, we should know this is also Krishna and Radha and Krishna. So this is our understanding. It is a deep philosophical insight. And our Acharya Shri Prabhupada advice is the same. Not only that, even Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj says the same thing. There's an argument. Oh, sometimes you should say Vishnu, Vishnu, Bhakti Siddhanta said no. Krishna, Krishna. To us, Krishna is more important than Vishnu, though, though they are the same. But why Krishna? And why that Krishna form is important? This is the science behind, you know, this is the philosophy. So you follow the same trend. Whether you are worshipping Ladu Gopal, we should know that one day you grow up and you play the flute. If you see Ramachandra, we know that he's the same Krishna. In the trailer, you will appear as Ram. If Prahlad is there, same Krishna will appear as Nashida. If this earth is sunken down, he will appear as Vara, lifted. Then, if Bali Maharaj comes, to Bali Maharaj, the most dear form of Krishna is Vaman, which is today. Today's appearance of Vaman Dev. To him, that short Krishna is very dear. To Hanuman, Ram is very dear. Every devotee has that is his own choice. But if you are learned, if you are taking the opinion of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna is everything. Does it answer your question? Yes, Prabhuji. So, uh, in our temple, in our house temple, when you have everybody, you just pay your obeisances to everybody, but you concentrate on yes. Each one of them will give you a different mood. But you should know that the origin of everything. That word should be kept in the mind. It is quoted in Bhagavad Gita. I think in verse number two, Bhagavad Gita, chapter two. And it's also the verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. You can always find it. Krishna stu Bhagavan Swami. Vyasana himself says, from Krishna comes all other incarnations. All the incarnations are Swamsa, means uh, expansion, expansions, or further expansion. But the original Bhagavan is Krishna. This is Vyasana saying, not just Prabhupada saying. Vyasana himself says that. So we follow his instruction. Okay. Thank you very much, Prabhupada. Are there any other questions or comments? No... Yes, 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 Peter. Prabhu. Yes, Peter. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I wanted to request you if you can repeat the four offenses. And okay, maybe four kind of offenses. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe four kind of offenses. Is, okay. okay, four offenses are first two Vaishnavas. It's called devotees, it's called Vaishnava Prat. Dhamma apra to the residents of a place of pilgrimage. Third is seva apra. Seva means while serving, you don't commit offenses with other devotees or in your service. And the fourth is dhamma apra, which you already know. So these are the four apra. So what is the second question? Uh, the meaning of the words yam and niyam. yam. Is okay, different. yam and niyam. Niyam means don'ts. Niyam means do's. Oh. Yam means Four regular principles. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. No meat eating, no drinking, no illicit sex, no gambling. This is called yam. Niyam means chanting 16 rounds. Main rule. Is it okay? Yes, Prabhu. Also, I uh, wanted to, maybe you can explain if, uh, 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 like, uh, Aswatama's hair was cut off. Uh, but yes. nowadays, we see that uh, the Brahmanas mainly because this con has the Brahmins now uh, that they are yeah, we shave our hair. So Yeah, but we don't shave all hair. We keep Shika. Oh, that's but in yeah. case of Ashwasama, his Shika was also cut, which is an insult. Oh. Okay. Okay. 
very beginning to sell. Like I keep shika, most devotees keep shika. If someone cuts off shika, even by mistake, it is an offense. It's a shame. Shika means that you are, the word uh, why we keep shika means we accept the authority of the Vedas. That is the meaning of shika. Is okay, Peter? Yes, thank you. Now, once Please. your shikha is removed, it means you don't obey Vedas, or you don't believe in Vedas. <laughs> okay. So we are following very culture. We are accepting the instruction of the Vedas. So why cut it off? Another meaning is that you are, uh, because before you accepted the spiritual master, you accept the authority of the Vedas. That is also another meaning. Not necessary, it should be a very long shika. It can be a short shika, enough. We are we cannot copy Chanakya Pandit. Chanakya Pandit had a long shika touching the ground. There's a reason why. He says, Till the foreigners rule India, I'm not going to cut my shika. <laughs> and he united so many kings. At that time, there was a Greek rule, and the Greeks left the country. We are successful. Okay, any other question? Okay, if there are no more questions, I can hand over to Pat Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Kandatmana Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhuji. <clears throat> Prabhuji, uh, already we covered this one, the, uh, chapter number seven. But uh, when we are going to the Mahabharat, we can know so many instances are there and that is not justified. Like uh, by the inspiration of uh, instruction of uh, Krishna, Dhrashtra Maharaj told lie. Also by the instruction of uh, Krishna, Arjun go and took the arrows from the, uh, what is uh, Pitama Bhishma. Mm. Yeah, Duryodhana um, by the instruction. And so, Your speech is getting cut. I can't hear. Krishna is the all in all and he can do anything. He can do something uh, like a other. So we supposed to be not, there is no question mark is that. The ethics mm. and the principles. Yeah, please. Okay, can I answer that question? First of all, yes, Prabhu did, did the Kauravas follow any ethics before the war? You answer. Did they follow any ethics? No. So why no. should the the Pandas follow the ethics? When it came to killing Karna, it was Karna who had actually abused Draupadi. It was Karna who was the part of killing Abhimanyu. He was one of them. So even if he's killed mm. in an unfair way, it is justified. So we can't blame Krishna for that. Speaking the life of Yudhishthira, because the whole plan was that if Yudhishthira would not say yes to Dronacharya, then Dronacharya would not stop killing. He was slaughtering millions, I mean, thousands of soldiers of the Patras. So he had to be stopped. And this was the only way. So it's not unfair. And as it is, Dronacharya had taken the side of a crooked man, and that is Duryodhana. So there's nothing wrong. And which is the third thing you said? Yeah. Why is no, Yeah, but yeah. the thing is that the, if you read the Mahabharata, if you read the Mahabharata, the whole war is justified. Uh, Prabhupada yes, says, if somebody is cunning, you know, cunning. Yeah, cunning. cunning. Then if you become cunning, there's nothing wrong. At that time, you don't start thinking, oh, I am a devotee, how can I be cunning? You can be, it is allowed. According the to the that, Yes, mm. Prabhuji. But the mm. thing is that we know the Kauravas are like that. All the Kauravas party, all the Kauravas, uh, like Karna, Dushashan, Duryadhan, Shakuni, they are all the crooked people. They are the, like the cunning person. So yes. we cannot accept the good morality from them. But when there is a Krishna and Arjuna, we can aspect the morality. But each one, Krishna had a reason for each one of them. No one was killed unfairly. Krishna gave the fair decision. 
and Krishna gave the answer. For example, killing of Duryodhan. The mace was hit here on the head, on the what yes. is that, on the hip. Yeah. Now, according to according to the mace fight, this is not allowed. But Krishna says, if you want to spare Bhima, this is the way out. Do it. And it was the wish of Krishna that he should be killed. He should be punished because he was the biggest criminal among all the Kauravas. He was the main criminal, aggressor. So it's nothing wrong. It is okay. Yeah? Yes, Prabhuji. Yeah. So at last we can consider what is Krishna told and what is Krishna's instruction that is okay. Yes, whatever Krishna says is okay. You do not believe when Yudhishthira was told to speak a lie, he was not ready. He had already committed yeah. a sin towards Krishna. Supreme Personality of God is telling Yudhishthira to do it. Yudhishthira was not ready and that is why his chariot gave down. Otherwise his chariot was flying. He was so pure. Mm -hmm. What a reaction at once. Oh. So if you don't obey our spiritual master, if you don't obey Krishna, if you don't obey his chastas, then we should be ready to face the consequences. We have to suffer. It's okay? Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Also, thanks all the devotees here to Radhik Srimad Bhagavatam. So I request all the devotees, please unmute yourself and chant Hare Krishna Mantra for glorification of his grace, Rukma Prabhuji. Please join. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare 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 is Gresh Rukma Prabhu ki jai. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hare Bol, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.